I'm working on this little painting today. It's going to be one of my pieces that are eventually framed and resin sealed inside one of these guys. And it's a little bit of a study also because I have a much larger piece that I want to work on. Here's the sketch for that. Well, you can see part of it. And you can see here, this is the bird and the other little guys that I've isolated out into this piece. And I'm doing this as a smaller piece right now because I had some ideas about how I wanted to treat the main bird in this with gold leaf. And I wasn't quite sure how it would fit in with the larger piece as a whole. And so I want to try it out first in this more isolated context where I have less fear of making mistakes with it or, you know, if it doesn't come out quite as expected or if it doesn't meld well with the concept that I have for the rest of the painting, it won't matter as much. So the first thing that I'm doing here is I am mixing some colors. I'm preparing my base surrounding area color. And I'm going to be having this as a mostly sort of greenish toned area. And I want to have some textural stuff to play with. So therefore I am using my Daniel Smith colors. And right now what I'm mixing, a few different colors. I'm using undersea green, green appetite, uh, lunar blue, and a little bit of dioxide green as well. And all of these are pretty heavily granulating pigments that Daniel Smith offers, which I love. And that means that the colors sort of separate and create interesting textures. Now, first thing I'm doing is wetting some of the area with mostly clean water that I'm going to drop this wet and wet into. And the, the granulation happens best if you let the pigment do its thing and move on your page without too much interference of brushwork. That's why I do this wet and wet and that's why I'm just sort of dotting it in there. I do want to pull it down into this tail area. You see that the pigment only moves where the page is wet. That's how you get to control your watercolors. You wet down the areas where you want movement of your colors. If you don't want it to move into those areas, then don't wet it. And you see, I haven't wet down this stuff. That's why it stays dry. Meanwhile, over here, and even you can see how it stops right at the edge of the bird because, again, I only had my liquid going up to the edge of his wings. Now here, it's a smaller little corner of the piece, and so I'm not bothering to do the wet and wet. I'm just painting it as a glaze directly in there. That way I have more control over how the uh, pigment goes into all the little spaces. But watering it down a little over here because that's where the tail feathers continue on up into. And oh, also you'll notice that I'm not really careful about my border of the piece as well because again, as I said, this is going to be in one of my little framey things. So it's going to be all cut out anyway, and the outside frame won't really matter to me at that point. Now, again, I am wetting down with my larger, this is like what, um, a half inch flat brush. Just putting down my clear water into the areas where I want the pigment to spread. And I want this to blend a little bit better here too. I don't want that hard edge. Did you see that? How it was like a little jaggedy hard edge? That happens if the pigment reaches the edge of your wetness, reaches the edge of 
your watered area and it has nowhere else to move and so it just kind of piles up onto the edge. So sometimes it's great to have those hard edges. Other times I want to get rid of them as soon as I spot it. Because sometimes it can be distracting if it's in the wrong area. And I'm just taking various mixtures of those initial colors that I told you about at the start. Sometimes I'm using my mix and sometimes I'm just using the color directly. And sometimes I'm just dropping water like this big black splotch over there. I want to break that up a little bit so I add a little bit more water and that forces the pigment then to pile out of there, to fall out of that, that little zone. And then down into this lower area, I'm going to actually use buff titanium. And I'm just glazing that in directly here. No wet and wet stuff, just doing it. It's kind of a nice, very neutrally toned yellowish beige. I find it surprisingly useful as a color, much more so than I would have thought when I initially bought it. Uh, I didn't think I'd be using it so much, but it has turned into one of my favorite colors, especially for mixing and using to neutralize some of the really bright tones, but also giving you a light base to work from. Let's see. So I think that's it's good for my initial base washes at this point. I'm going to let this dry and then we will work on the next phases in just a few minutes. In this circular area down here, I am going to paint a little bit of watercolor ground. This is Daniel Smith Clear Watercolor Ground. It's not actually very clear, as you can see, it looks quite white. So you have to be careful not to paint it too thick if you actually want to make use of the clear part of it. For myself here, it is not terribly critical. And I'm painting it on fairly thick. because now I'm going to take some copper leaf. This is also known as, it's sold as gold leaf, but essentially it is fake and it is made from copper. But it has its uses. One of the uses which I have talked about in the past in some of my other videos is the fact that it, because it's so thick, you know, you can see I can handle this with my hands. I mean, it's thin, but it's not super delicate. I can, I can hold it without it just completely falling to pieces or sticking to my fingers or blowing off with the wind. Um, it sort of repels liquid from its surface once I have it in place, which doesn't sound all that, but for the usage that I put it to, um, it is a characteristic that I want, whereas real 24 karat gold leaf is very, very thin and fragile and basically turns to dust once you use it. And because of that, um, I think that because of that, because of the way it does that, the liquid kind of finds those little gaps in the dust and, and so it doesn't get repelled. And so when I paint on top of 24 karat gold leaf, it turns into paint on top of 24 karat gold leaf. Whereas if I paint on top of this, 
it um, gets kind of pushed away and pools a little bit in interesting ways. You'll see as I work on top of this later what I mean. So what I'm doing now is I'm just laying it into my watercolor ground. So that essentially it, it just becomes encased in here. And you can see I'm just tearing off small pieces to work with. Now while this dries in a little bit, I'm going to start working in other areas of the painting. A few more little pieces. Okay, so I'm done with this little bit and I'm going to start working on painting other stuff. I'm going to start painting these little birds over here. And the first thing I want to do, you know how I mentioned earlier when I was doing the washes about how if you have the pigment reach the edge of your liquid, sometimes it will just pile up there and leave this hard edge. Well, that's, that's what I'm talking about over here. That's what these things are. And so I don't really want that hard, hard edge right where I have an actual edge. I mean, where the bird is appearing here. I want to have it softer. And so I'm just taking clean water and a brush and I'm just scrubbing at the paper a little bit over there in those areas. And what that does is it lifts the pigment. It pulls it up off the page. Not completely though. I mean, it's, it's still there, but it softens all those hard edges and blends it out. Now you can see there's no longer this very definitive edge any longer. It's more of a blend into the surroundings. You can compare that to right here where I haven't done any of the lifting. Let's get in closer. And I'm going to do the same over here. Though I don't think it's going to matter as much over here because I'm going to be doing a lot of gold leaf stuff, but I'd rather soften it now then worry about it later. Mainly though I want to do it over on this bird. Now this guy is fine too because his background color is not very contrasting so you don't really see it as much there. I missed some areas of wash so I'm gonna fill that in right there. And where else? Up at the top here, there's a couple little corners. I'm going to use some rose tinted colors. Just glazing stuff in, not being terribly careful because this is all just background noise stuff. And 
And in fact, messiness sometimes adds interest than when you go forward with the more deliberate parts and aspects. Okay, so what I did there was I just glazed everything lightly with a bit of the red mixture, reddish pink mixture that I had over here. I have no idea what color this is. This was left over from a previous painting and it I just hadn't cleaned out my palette, but you know, you can just use it. It's watercolor. It never goes, it's not like it goes bad and you can just keep using those colors unless I need a pure shade of something, particularly when I want bright yellows and golds. I will clean out my palette because you will really not see those. You won't get the intensity of the color if you have too many other random shades muddying things up. A little bit more down here too. Back now to these two little guys. Now I want, let me see, make sure he's dry. He's mostly dry, he's a little bit damp to touch, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try working on him, but if he's too wet, I might need to pause again. Because if he's wet, then the paint is just gonna bleed and move all over the place, and I don't want that. So I'm keeping him mostly in the same tones and colors as I used in the background so far because this little bird is sort of, I don't want him competing for attention. He's not one of the focal compositional key keystones, but he is sort of a background rhythm and texture, really. So in keeping with that, I'm using mostly these same green tones that I started off with earlier. Um, let's see, look at his little head. Get a little bit darker with that, mixing some lunar blue in. And I am using a size zero Royal and Lang nickel brush. And this is a mixture of, it's sort of glazing, sort of dry brushing. <laughs> you see as I, as I work up into his neck, I'm using these short curved strokes with my brush that sort of mimics the texture of the shadowed ridges of feathers. It doesn't have to be super defined, and in fact, I don't want it to be too regular or too sharply in focus. What I, what I want to do here is I'm, I'm just trying to maintain that rhythm in the way I use my brush strokes. Because that's what that's what your eyes see then when you look at these, when you look at the picture, when you look at a painting. You're not gonna see all the tiny little details in the background, but you are going to register the rhythm and movement that your brain expects from a texture. And in this case, feathers. So you see, I'm, I'm doing that all along the surface here. And then I'm going to blend out some more of it with light glazes. I'm not blending everything out smoothly, but I am sort of softening it all. 
and I'm making sure to leave brighter spots though. I'm not touching some of these little white bits, you see. I leave those as they are with the dry brush. bit of his wing coming out underneath the other bird. And the rest of his body would be out this way, but I don't want it to be sharply in focus. I just want to have hints of it in the shading in the shadows here. Well, not shadows, but in the, in my negative space. because this is, again, I want this to recede. I don't want it to be fighting for attention with some of my more foreground elements. This other bird. Now he's going to have a little bit more intensity of contrast to him because he is closer to the foreground. So you create focus for your viewers via contrast. And there's a few different kinds of contrast. There is the contrast of detail level. So for example, as I was talking about with this other bird in the background element over here of his body fading off. That is a, a detail contrast because in the, the areas where I want, um, I want it to really recede and push back. I, I do barely any detail and I kind of leave everything very soft and out of focus. This kind of mimics the way we see and perceive everything in our, in our world because your focus, you see the details and you notice the detailing and the, the little bits of something only when you focus and look at it. And everything else in the periphery of your vision is, is going to be it's going to be either unnoticed or you know out of focus because that's not where your eyes are concentrating and of course with modern photography we are even more our brains are even more used to this concept of backgrounds blurring out because of the way a camera's eye a lens it does that as well So that's the first kind of contrast that you can think about. It's the contrast of detail level. The second kind of contrast then is going to be with color intensity. And you'll notice that this, this bird has a little bit more of a bluish tone to him because I, I mixed in a little bit of my blues and that gives me color contrast against the background, which is much more of a greenish yellow, a yellowish green, sorry I meant.
color contrast then gives your viewer something to latch on to very easily. Frequently when I'm working, when I'm designing my composition, I, I like to think about contrast in terms of completely complementary colors. I'll frequently use something that is diametrically uh, opposite from one color on the color wheel for the background and you know then the other color for the foreground and this creates an automatic tension between your foreground and background elements using complementary colors really sets up this tension and makes your your foreground thing, if you use the opposite color, really just pop out of the page. You can't help but, not, but do that, especially just because of the way colors across from the color wheel are going to either be warm or cool. And by doing this, by using the opposite colors, you are automatically setting up a warm, cool um, contrast. even within this much more limited color contrast range that I'm doing on this little bird, it sets up a cool warm thing as well because the yellow tones of the background green automatically give that a much more warmer feel while the bluish tones of this little guy gives him a cooler feel. I'm blending stuff out lifting and just using water to smooth out my edges. Uh, the areas that I'm painting over here are a little bit wet from when I just did that water wash a second ago. So my edges are going to be not quite smooth. They're blending out a little bit into the surroundings. It's not super wet. I mean, if it was if it was loaded down with water, then this would instantly kind of disintegrate into the surroundings. But it's just a little bit of softness that is provided because of the moisture level in the paper. Moving back over to this section of the piece, I am now using white watercolor ground. And I am using it to create a surface for my watercolor so that I can sort of make this gold stuff here blend into my watercolor.
And then again, I'm going to let that stuff dry while my attention goes elsewhere. Moving on to bird number three. This one is going to be more purplish. Even more contrast. Oh yeah, so I was talking about contrasts before. And I mentioned contrast of level of detail, so that would be focus, contrast of color. And then the other kind of contrast is that of the, the luminosity, the, the tone, darkness, and light. That's most easy to see when you work in monochrome because that will be one of the few methods of contrast that, well, there's only three, that will be mostly the limiting level of contrast in your at your disposal. It's harder sometimes to really make use of it effectively when you're working with large number of colors because we get distracted by, ooh, pretty colors. <laughs> and you forget then about the tone and how that is an extremely important, important aspect of a picture and the composition. Sometimes I take a finished or an almost finished piece and I'll either scan it or take a photograph of it and look at it in Photoshop. And I'll just desaturate the entire piece and turn it into a grayscale just so that I can see exactly what is going on with my tonal contrast and how that is affecting the overall flow and movement of the piece. What you want to see when you do that then is large blocks or shapes, if you're squinting at your piece, of dark and light because this is what's going to structure your tonal contrast. And if you have lots and lots of little bits and pieces here and there, then that means that your tonal contrast is not very focal, is not very focused, which can be fine, but uh, it's just something to keep in mind, I guess, as you are designing your compositions and how focus you want your viewer to be on your main subjects. Now I also achieve contrast one further by one further method. I use textural elements as well. Sometimes this is the physical texture of the watercolor ground that I am, I paint into my base. And sometimes it is the reflective textural rhythms that I get from using gold leaf. Now that is one method of contrast that I intend to use in this piece. You guys don't know what's going on in my head just yet <laughs> because I'm hoping to make that work in this painting. But what I have planned is that the main focal bird in this, uh, this guy down here, the one that I haven't painted yet, he is actually going to be in gold leaf and slightly relief as well, possibly. I'm not quite sure yet. You can see that I'm just kind of playing with stuff as I go. That's kind of why I'm doing this piece this way in this small format instead of just diving in 
to the much larger format that I have planned. Uh, but yeah, so I, I want to use I want to use gold leaf for the majority of that bird, and to have the body kind of dissolving into a a almost graphical um, depiction. I'm going to be using a lot of line work in there, and not so much actual shading and rendering as I'm doing with these other little birds that are surrounding. So, you know, there I'm using a, a textural contrast. Moving up this bird chain. What kind of birds are these? Someone asked me once, expecting that they were some actual species. I call them stuffy birds, or <laughs> my husband calls them that at any rate. They're basically whatever color and pattern I need them to be in order to suit my compositional coloring needs. But that's the glory of fantasy art, right? The art, the art's needs can dictate reality. It's kind of why I like going back and forth between doing my botanical art and my fantasy art. Sometimes I stick very true to reality within my fantasy work, and other times I decide to just play and go forth with whatever I think the piece needs. And there's something very freeing about that. I'm playing, going back and forth between wet and wet glazes and dry brush as I do these guys here to get the effect, effective blending that I want. Like right now, this is, I'm just moving the pigment around a little bit in these wet areas. because you can sort of control the shape of your wet and wet and your glazes as you do this by just sort of tickling the page with the tip of your brush 
on the leading wet areas. And then I do some dry brush to add hints of feathers. Just the barest hint of it though. I don't want to make it overpowering because I like this very soft blending that I've achieved so far. And I don't want to overpower that. This guy down in the lower left, I think I'm going to be going back to more greenish tones for him so that it recedes a little bit just because it's so close here to the main focal bird. And I don't want any jarring um, competition for the attention here. I'm just glazing in the color. And then I want to add a little more intensity of color at the, around the eye and along the beak. Blending it out into that glazed wash. And I'm going to add a little bit of. Oh, nope, it's too wet for me to add any detail yet. I'm going to have to wait till the wing dries a little bit before I can add any feather detail. All right, meanwhile, I'm also going to add a glaze of some serpentine green mixed with whatever I've got here, some of this blue, into the surrounding stuff. Now that all of that has dried.
This is still too wet. I've got one last bird up here I can work on while that one's drying. And I'm shifting back to the darker purpley tones for this one. Switching up to a larger brush slightly. I think this is a size one Winsor Newton Series 7 Kolinsky Sable. I'm using a mixture of browns and purpley reds here. I want that to be a bit darker, more intense. So I'm going to grab some bloodstone, which is almost a black, but it's a very warm brownish toned black. I'm doing that thing again which I described early on in this in this piece where I am mimicking the textures that I want in my brush strokes. So I'm doing these short little curved brush strokes along the wings to give the hint of feathers. And my paint, my underlayer here is not 100% dry. It's, it's very close to dry, but it's just wet enough that there is a little bit of bleeding and softening of the edges as I do this. Not enough for them to become obliterated, but definitely a softening. And this, this side is definitely completely dry now, so my lines are more hard-edged and more defined. I'm 
then I take a little bit of water to even blend them some more. Not completely, just a little bit along the edges. And I wanted to add a little bit of wing texture to this guy down here too. What I've got here now is Colner Maniatum. It is a gold leaf sizing, which means it is what you use to glue gold leaf onto a surface. Colner Maniatum is the brand and specific product that I'm using. This is simply a crow quill pen. You can buy these little nibs for 99 cents usually at any art store and then stick it into a nib holder. I have a fancy one just because I like it. But these can also be had for 99 cents. And all I'm going to do is dip it into the maniatum and just treat it like I would ink. It's a little bit thicker than normal ink would be, but it still does flow through the pen. And it is pink colored so that you can see. Some gold leaf sizings are clear. This is not one of those. I like the fact that it's pink because it helps to be able to see where you have drawn it. I've used some of the clear ones and it becomes quite impossible <laughs> without trying to, uh, without uh, twisting and turning your piece under some light to try to figure out where you have already um, put some of it. I particularly like Maniatum because, because of the fact that it's thin enough to flow through a crow quill pen. Um, it makes cleanup quite easy. I don't have to worry about brushes and things. Because all I do is just wipe off my pen nib tip when I'm done and it's all clean. We're going to go through the rest of this sizing application via time lapse because it's pretty much just watching me do this.
Okay, this is what it looks like when the manitum is at a dry enough state to adhere the gold leaf to it. It's no longer wet, so it has a slight sheen to it because it is tacky and sticky. And that's what's going to make the let the gold leaf stick to it. You don't want to do it too soon because otherwise you'll just smear the sizing all over the place and have a big sticky gold leaf mess. Going back in now and adding contrast, adding some more contrast. I've got some purple on my brush and I am just painting a wash over most of this upper area. And as well, over here, I'm still painting a wash, just a, a glaze of color. Sorry about that. I'm doing this to make the gold of the bird 
really pop more and come to the foreground by making everything around it a really nice contrast. Now when I'm darkening things, I have to make sure that I pull my contrast darkness out into the surroundings so that I don't end up with just a dark outline around the bird, which is not what I want. The other thing I'm going to do now is work in some enhancements of the background textures. So you see this dark splotch here with a lot of granulation going on in the pigment? I love that. I'm not going to paint over it but I am going to enhance the areas around it and try to simulate more of that texture as, my work, as I work some of these outside areas into it so that it seems to move and flow. So I shape it. I shape what was already there and I try to give it more form and let it integrate with my more intentful elements like the feathers of the wing over here. I want that darkness to kind of come in towards it to not quite envelop it, but to trail off the edges. Instead of just hanging out at a distance as it was.
messing with this stuff over here. I want to give it a little bit of that feel as well. So that it integrates better with the surroundings. Next, I'm going to be using this mica-based watercolor paint. In case you're going to ask, I do not know the brand. And if you can read that Japanese, <laughs> then you can find it. <laughs> but I found this at a Dick Blick store once upon a time. because gold is, you know, either there or not. So you can't really blend it, but with the use of these mica-based paints, of which there are many different brands out there, not just this one that I'm using. In fact, I have some, let's see, there's a Fine Tech, and there is a creamer pigments version. Each of them has a slightly different quality of the golden shiny tone that it has. So they're all a little bit different. I find that this, this Japanese one here matches the tone of the 24 karat gold the best. So that's my favorite to use for this purpose. Sometimes I'm able to match the tone pretty well with mixtures of some of the other brands. But this one works pretty well, just straight out. And by, by what I mean by matching is that it looks pretty indistinguishable from the actual 24 karat gold if I paint it quickly enough along these areas. There's a little bit of difference. Uh, the gold leaf itself has more of a gleam to it because it's, it's actual metal there, whereas the mica paints generally have more of a sparkle. the way glitter sparkles. So I don't like it as much. And that's why I only use it in very small quantities in these kind of areas and situations. And I prefer to use the actual gold instead.
thank you for watching me paint this. Thanks for spending the past hour with me, keeping me company. And this is what it looks like in its finalized form. Well, almost, because I'm still going to have to pour resin over this area and seal it all in. But that's what it will be. So thank you for joining me today. And I would like to also take a moment right now to thank all of my patrons over at www.patreon.com slash Stephanie Law because it's those guys that really help support making these videos possible. So if you like what you've seen today and you're not yet a member, please come over and check it out because for as little as $2 a month, you too can help make these videos possible and help me keep creating them because they do take a lot of time and a lot of work to not only do the paintings, but then to do the editing and everything else that is involved in this whole process. So once again, I'm really thankful to everyone that does pitch in for that. And I hope you enjoyed this and I hope it inspired you maybe to play around with some of these materials on your own as well. And if you do, uh, share it with me. I'd love to see what you create as well. <laughs>